Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian at the Surface Navy Association's 29th Annual Symposium and Trade Show in Arlington, Virginia. Our coverage here is sponsored by Raytheon, and we're talking to uh, Scott Forney, who is the president of uh, Electromagnetics at General Atomics. Scott, thanks for talking to us. It's my pleasure, Vago. Good to see you. Um, good, good seeing you. You know, you guys really have focused on electromagnetics and have a reputation for that. Obviously, you're doing the electromagnetic uh, launch system for the Ford-class carrier. That's going to be the next generation launch system as the, the U.S. Navy transitions from steam catapults to electromagnetics. You guys are doing the entirely new arresting gear system on it. You guys have also invested an enormous amount of money on, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated electromagnetics for motor applications. And then you're also spending an enormous amount of your own money on, on gun technology, on developing uh, r rail guns. Talk to us, you know, bring us up to speed on, you know, what you're learning, what the state of the art is, um, you know, obviously on, on emails and the catapults, you guys have faced uh, a, a degree of challenges in sort of getting to this new thing. Bring us up to speed on where you stand on all of these programs. Uh, thanks, Vago. I'd, I'd like to do that. So first of all, if I can give you just a little bit of background, um, if you look at General Atomic's portfolio, for five decades now, we've been involved in both fusion and fission technologies. And when you uh, run the largest fusion test reactor in the United States, the D3D Tokamak, you have to move around about uh, 2,000 megawatts of power and being able to control that kind of power accurately is why we got into emuls and the advanced arresting gear in the first place. In addition to that, uh, about 20 years ago we started developing the world's largest electric drive systems on trucks. Um, we provided all those trucks, I think there's 87 or so trucks still in existence over in Asia and Australia and uh, North America. Those trucks now are operated by Caterpillar. Uh, the truck drive system was about accurately driving at about 40 miles an hour with an 800 ton fully loaded truck. That's not easy, but more importantly, we had to stop the trucks. We had to be able to stop on a, a hillside and hold it there without any brake systems. We're the only manufacturer in the world that does that today. That technology allowed us to figure out how we were going to deal with the momentum issues associated with advanced arresting gear. So if we look back at our start in 1999 on linear motors that ended up being the linear motors basis for the EMOLS catapults, that technology was already understood by General Atomics. The hard part is how do you adapt it to military application? And the challenge over the last decade has been get the military application done correctly, get it built qualified and then make sure the control system is done and like any new technology it's very very hard but once you're done you have so much redundancy that I think we're going to see a great deal of advantages we don't know about today both on the emuls and the advanced arresting gear system. And and where are you on emuls now? Are you over the hump and do you feel that you're clear to you know because obviously you know trials are beginning on Forge soon uh, obviously the Navy wants to get that ship uh, into service as quickly as possible. Where are we on emails now? Uh, EMOLS, um, we've uh, completed over 450 manned airplane uh, launches, both regular launches and also what we call um, purposely failed launches of the equipment. So we would break a piece of equipment in the middle of a launch to demonstrate the reliability of the system. Um, that part is done. We are fully delivered on uh, uh, Gerald Ford class. Um, There's some very minor uh, qualification tests that remain on the program, but I would say in large part uh, EMOLS is uh, significantly behind us. And uh, let's talk about the arresting gear. I mean, one of the challenges was, you know, on the conventional current system of arresting gear, you could be off center on off on lineup, but still the system corrects for it mechanically. You know, one of the challenges was, you know, your, your system didn't do that. What have you done to adapt that to solve that problem so that that becomes sort of, the, the, you know, qualified as the next generation? You know, what have you done to solve the problem and when do you think that everything's going to be sorted out on that? So important to note that when we um, started on the EMOS program, there was a significant contract between us and North of Grumman on the PDRR program. So we built a full-scale, half-length system, and we were able to prove out the technology um, and from 2000 to 2004. And then we uh, started in earnest in 2005 on the program. The advanced arresting gear didn't really have that risk development program. So our risk development program, instead of being done on a PDRR program, is actually being done at Lakehurst, at the jet car site and at the runway site. And, and some folks don't understand that we didn't know how the system was going to perform until we got into the test program. I think what you're referring to is there are big challenges with how do you keep the airplane 
going straight when it is um, offset, such because the planes can fly in at all kinds of offset conditions. Uh, and uh, this year we've done 350, excuse me, 2016, we did 351 man arrestments. Again, like EMALS, we do them off center, we do them uh, in different failure modes, and the system behaved very well. Um, the big challenge was we had to get into the test program to prove the technology, and um, uh, AG still has some uh, some challenges ahead of us, but uh, this was a big win in 2016 to prove the uh, uh, control system for divergence trajectory. And how many people, you know, when, when, when you know, folks sometimes question, like, why is the Navy moving to this technology? Why not stay with steam-powered catapults and conventional arresting gear? What was the rationale for this? Because you're taking quite a lot of people out of the system, aren't you? Yeah, that's the big deal. Uh, and Vago, you've got that right. When you look at how many people it requires to maintain the legacy equipment, which obviously works very well, we're taking off 35% of the crew associated with both the catapult and the arresting system. When you extrapolate those costs to support the sailors over a 50-year lifespan, uh, the government's number uh, that I, I listened to in testimony a few years ago in emails is after all the capital costs, we still save about a quarter billion dollars per ship on emails. I haven't seen the numbers on the arresting gear, but it's about the same order of magnitude as my guess, but I, I don't know the final numbers. You know, the Ford class is extraordinary in that almost everything about it is, is, is new. It, it is about the Navy's transition to electrically powered ships. We've seen that also in the Zumwalt class and, and, and what's happening there. You know, Columbia is going to do the same thing in terms of uh, the, the, the new class of ballistic missile submarines. You know, in course of doing this program, what are some of the things that you guys have learned that you can apply to other programs? Uh, that's a great question. I, I reference back to some of our technology in the nuclear uh, business with fusion and fission and our truck business, but this system is much larger, uh, and the amount of power electronics and generation of power that we had to provide with emails is in excess of a gigawatt of power. That's orders of magnitude than any uh, maritime vessel in the world today, and so being able to control that power and to reliably uh, predict what's going to happen in the system, that was the significant part of the development of the program. And the engineers uh, that we use on these programs are kind of unique. They're power engineers. Uh, and although we've done lots of power work, now that we have come through emails and now that we're finishing up on the advanced arresting gear, we've been able to take that technology and apply it to other applications, whether it's uh, other fully integrated electric drive systems and uh, our, our centerpiece program that we're investing in right now is Railgun. But GA has a distinction in the United States that if you look at all the ships, we talked about DDG-1000 or we talked about whatever the future electric ships are, we've been able to develop the generation of power, the delivery of power, and everything in between. And we, we have the, the bragging rights today, frankly, of being the only company that's seen our technology uh, go into operation in the next couple of months on the, on the uh, Gerald Ford. That's a big deal. Uh, so when you start looking at other electric drive technologies and how do you use that integrated power for future directed energy weapons, for example, I think we're in a very good place to be able to help the Navy transition those programs. Let's go. You mentioned electromagnetic railgun. That's something that you guys, it is a signature program for you. You have a much smaller version of it occasionally. You guys have had the big, uh, you know, the big barrel uh, over here, certainly for, for Navy League. Um, where are you guys on that? Because obviously BAE Systems has the development contract, but you guys have continued to invest in that. Talk to us a little bit about you know, what you view as you know, the state of that, the attributes of your program, and how you think things are going to play out over the next couple of years. A great question, Vago. Um, so General Thomas has had numerous contracts with the government uh, on uh, railgun technologies, uh, both on the pulse power side to generate the energy that's required, which is in the gigawatt, multi-gigawatt range, uh, and in the uh, tens of megajoule range. Uh, in addition, we've developed a, a large gun for the, the Navy, and we're on our third generation gun right now at General Atomics. If you go back to the EMOLS example, when we started this program, the semiconductors to turn on and off the catapult, the semiconductors that were required to give you the nice waveform that allows the motors to operate correctly, did not exist. It came out of the wind industry. So we use the largest SCRs that we know of in production in the world. The same thing with insulated gate bipolar transistors, which is fancy for the switches that give us that waveform. We took a look at that system and we applied the same kind of semiconductors to the railgun program to develop what's called a pulse forming network that allows us to accurately predict how that hybrid missile is going to get out of the railgun and to make sure we can do it over and over again. So today, uh, this year, we are going to test our third generation railgun and our fifth generation pulse power system that is matched at about a 10 megajoule scale, which is about 35 kilometers or so um, worth of capability that will 
we'll be testing uh, in Utah at the Dugway Proving Grounds later this year. And eventually the idea is for a 32 megajoule, correct, for the, for the operational cannon? Um, it's unclear to me what both the Navy and the Army will decide on what size it is. General Atomics worked on 10 megajoule and it's uh, based on a self-investment. The self-investment, we wanted to have something that was transportable for the Army to fit on helmets. Uh, whether they choose to use helmets or not, we don't know. So we've now made the pulse power and the railgun um, light enough and compact enough that it fits there. That's important because we also needed that uh, effective um, energy density to fit on a littoral combat or the future frigate. Right. And it's actually the pulse power that demands the most uh, space on the ship uh, to be able to provide that and the batteries for energy storage. And in both cases, we've been able to do that. Uh, in fact, in the last uh, eight or nine years, we've been able to compact the size of the pulse power system by about a factor of eight. And that's the technology that we've just manufactured and uh, we'll be testing this year at uh, Dugway Proving Grounds. And for a like-sized gun, from a conventional gun moving to uh, the railgun technology, is there a weight penalty? I mean, do you get certain advantages, but do you pay a penalty anywhere? Or can you make this sort of a net neutral by the time you include magazine handling equipment and everything else, by the time it adds up, it's actually an equal trade? Well, and that, again, another great question. You, you're sort of unlimited um, in uh, how much power that you can store because we, our approach is we use um, uh, very little power to store our shots in batteries. Uh, General Atomics is, I think, the only producer today of a fault-tolerant lithium-ion battery system that we can store shots in there, and then those batteries then will deliver the, the requ requisite power uh, to the capacitors that will then allow us to launch the hybrid missile systems. But most important is the projectiles are so small, which is a hybrid missile, if you will, uh, and they don't have any kinetic energy in them that you have a much greater magazine strength than you do on conventional systems. But keep in mind, this is about layered defense. It's not like you're trying to take away systems. So you're trying to fill in the gaps, and that's what I think Railgun does very nicely. Um, you guys are privately held, a uh, very large concern. Again, you talked about you know the commercial interests that the company has. The defense part uh, is actually a passion for the leadership of the company as well, and you guys have been involved in that in some time. Does that make it easier for you guys to take the kind of bets and investments that you guys have been able to make? You know, for example, um, you know, you, you guys have invested quite a lot of money. You know, how much has this allowed you, for example, to invest in, say, the railgun to get that technology up, to take that bet, to make it, to win big in the future? Um, again, a great question. I spent most of my career at a publicly traded company. Coming to a privately uh, uh, held company, I think, offers some advantages. Number one, um, to make decisions. I have one person over me to make a decision on. It's a very quick process to say we're going to go make an investment like that. Number two, we're also a commercial company. So uh, General Atomics Electromagnetic Systems um, has product in 68 countries, and we'll take that recovery from those program and we'll reinvest it in the technology such as Railgun because it's a passion of the company to help us get to the next technology. And I would say the freedom to invest uh, and to take a lot of that commercial money and, and put that also in the defense sector makes it very, very um, uh, desirable. Uh, plus, you know, uh, frankly speaking, when you look at some of our commercial technologies, we've been able to learn from those programs. If I may give you one example, we're, we're actually the number one provider in the world today um, for a program called Clarifying Slurry. If you think about making gasoline, you pull, um, you know, very heavy um, uh, oil out of the ground and crude oil out of the ground and you go through a cracking process and out comes gasoline or other thin like kerosene or something. The leftover is called slurry that is very laden with fines which is the process that's used to make uh, the product come out. We take that um, slurry that's very dirty, comes in at about 10,000 parts per million fines, and what comes out is about five parts per million. And that technology is actually electric. We're the only providers that I know of in the world that take the slurry and we uh, bring them through big uh, pressure vessels that are full of uh, stoichiometric glass beads, and it's a process that's called dioelectrophoresis that we put about 30,000 volts into those beads and we're able to clean that out so that when we're done, we just return that product back to refinery. That kind of technology is not unlike some of the use of electricity that we use in the defense programs. And that came to us uh, because of our commercial programs. And so a lot of the investment that we did on that program 
things like getting the right welds done, uh, getting the right um, production lineup. We now use on railgun programs and even on the carrier program, it makes us have a lower cost, longer term product. So it's a very good skill set for us to learn from. What are some other commercial applications that you guys are working? Because you know you, you just said you know that you try to use that virtuous cycle all the time to sort of drive the ball forward, both for your commercial business, but also in defense. So there's two other directed energy programs that we've been able to take this energy storage idea and this control technology and take it to the next level. And if you also look at the, the key technology in our pulse power is something called a, an energy storage capacitor. Um, so the two other technologies we're also working on is high power radio frequency technology. That's a non-lethal technology that you can shut down engines in a, in a vehicle or you can shut down the, a, some sort of a small a quadcopter is high, you can turn off the electronics. And that requires a different form of pulse power and a different form of controls, but that is a spin out of the technology we talked about on the carrier and on railgun. Secondly, we also uh, developed solid state lasers and we're in the middle of a major test program right now with the government and that technology uses uh, uh, very, very dense batteries, uh, lithium polymer battery that we store energy and we release the laser technology very, very accurately with control systems. And that's kind of all related. So General Atomics is trying to make sure that if it's electric technology, we're in the middle of it. Uh, thanks very much, Scott. And, and uh, you know, for anybody who loves uh, electric power, Faraday, Tesla, Westinghouse, and Edison are smiling down on you guys. Thanks very much. Hey, it's my pleasure, Vago. Have a great day.